There's a reason why you do the intubations in your hospital. It's not because of your dexterity. You don't have some mystical myelination to muscle fibers that magically makes you more adept at managing airways. That's not it. I could probably take pretty much anybody in my hospital. I could take them to the operating room for a couple months and they would be able to put plastic through vocal cords. That's not the reason why you're intubating. The reason why you are intubating is because you know everything that could go wrong and you're making the proper preparations before you push meds to make sure badness doesn't happen. Here's take home to the entire talk. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Every intubation can result in death. I know you know this. I know this is super simplistic, but it's so important to remember. I'm going to say it again. Every intubation can result in death. In the emergency department, we intubate, there's about a 4% chance that our patient's going to suffer from post-intubation cardiac arrest. In other words, intubation attempt goes great. We get the tube in, and within minutes, we're on the chest doing chest compressions, trying to resuscitate that patient. If that happens, there's an 84% chance that patient's going to have an in-hospital death. If we allow them to suffer from post-intubation cardiac arrest, more likely than not, they are going to never leave the hospital. And so we need to do everything possible before we push meds to prevent post-intubation cardiac arrest. Uh, There's a couple of different soap me mnemonics out there, and I like things from both of them, so I've combined them. This is my soap P me E mnemonic, which I think covers everything. I'm going to go through it quickly, and then there's a couple points on here that I really want to spend a little time on. First of all, suction, easy peasy, mac and cheesy, right? Make sure that you have your suction hooked up. If there's no regulator in the room, if there's no canister in the room, this can be time consuming. So before you start, check for suction. Make that the first thing that somebody's working on if it's not up and ready. Pre-oxygenation, denitrogenation, we're going to hit this pretty heavy in the panel, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But at a minimum, flush rate non-rebreather. If you're having any oxygenation issues, if your residual volume is decreased, non-invasive ventilator, BPAP, that's the way to pre-oxygenate. Airway equipment, this is the bare minimum you need. Tube, stylet, syringe, blade, bag valve mask device. We're going to come back to airway equipment in a minute. And then my first P is pharmacology. When I say pharmacology, the most common things we think about are our induction agent and our paralytic. Ketamine and erocuronium, these are my go-to for intubation. However, there is something you need to know about ketamine, and it's going to make you angry, but please stick with me. Ketamine is actually the worst induction agent that you could use, except for every other induction agent that exists. Listen to that again. Ketamine is the worst induction agent you could use except for every other induction agent that we use. And I really think that needs to be the way you think about ketamine. So, for example, head-to-head ketamine versus propofol. I think ketamine is superior. This recent trial looked at risk factors for cardiovascular instability during intubation. And a lot of them were obvious. Older patients are more likely to be cardiovascular instability during intubation. If they're hypotensive before you start, if they're hypoxic before you start, the things that we think about with our our H's that kill patients, hypoxia, hypotension, the hydrogen ion, or metabolic acidosis, all those were obvious. But propofol use was independently associated with peri-intubation cardiovascular instability. Propofol led to a lot of peri-intubation cardiovascular instability. So I do think that ketamine is superior to propofol. When you look at ketamine and automidate head-to-head, this study's been done a couple of times. This first paper, Jabre et all the way back in 2009, prospective randomized control trial looking at ketamine versus automidate. And really what they showed is they're pretty much equivalent. There was some laboratory evidence of adrenal suppression with automidate. So maybe slightly worse with automidate, but in a controlled environment, they're pretty equivalent. This is a more recent paper just published this year looking at automidate versus ketamine. Again, this is a controlled trial. Everything is controlled here. And what they found was seven-day mortality rates are actually higher with automidate. Now, when you go out to 28-day mortality rates, they're equivalent, no different. But in controlled environments, these medications, automidate and ketamine, are very similar in their performance, very similar in their cardiovascular side effects. Maybe a little bit worse with automidate, but this trial is the one that really shows us what we're actually doing. Because see, this is a retrospective 
evaluation of these two drugs. This is taken from the NEAR database, looking at what is actually happening in real life. This is not a control trial. All things are not necessarily equal here. No matter how much statistical jujitsu they try to do, not everything's equal. This is a reflection of what we're actually doing in practice. And what we're actually doing in practice, what this retrospective study showed, is that when we use ketamine, we have a lot more post-intubation hypotension when compared to all other agents, compared to Atomidate specifically, excuse me. And I think the reason for that is because we don't respect ketamine. We don't respect, and as a result, we're killing our patients with ketamine. We need to respect abnormal vital signs, specifically when we look at our shock index. For example, this patient, you're like, oh, they're a little tachycardic, but yeah, they're hypertensive, no big deal. Their shock index here is actually 0.8. Interesting thing about this shock index, this predicts post-intubation hypotension, shock index is 0.8 or higher, with only 67% sensitivity. So this patient is still at risk for post-intubation hypotension. However, when we use ketamine, I'm afraid that we're not concerned about it. We think, oh no, ketamine raises your blood pressure. It raises your heart rate. I don't need to worry about post-intubation hypotension. Every intubation can lead to death. Any patient, Society of Airway Management says, any patient with a shock index of 0.7 or higher, you need to prepare for post-intubation hypotension whether you are using ketamine or not. Ketamine, again, can drop your blood pressure. Think of ketamine as the worst induction agent except for every other one that we have. And so when I think about pharmacology, I think about my induction agent, my paralytic, but I also think about any vasopressors that I might need. And I'm getting those ready, ready prior to the intubation attempt. Before I push any meds, I'm thinking about what's going to happen if they have post-intubation hypotension, what meds am I getting, and am I getting those ready prior to the intubation attempt. Furthermore, when you look at rocuronium, there's been some studies on this, the ED awareness trial, which showed that when we're intubating in the ER, about 2.6% of our patients have clear awareness of things around them. This paper specifically showed rocuronium as a high predictor of patients that are going to have ED awareness or have awareness being paralyzed and not sedated. This more recent paper just published last month showed that the rate of awareness with paralysis may be as high as 7.4%. So because of that, when I get my pharmacology ready, I'm getting my induction agent, my initial paralytic, any vasopressors that I might need, but I'm also getting my ongoing analgesia and sedation ready before I push any meds. So this is my pharmacology, not just induction agent paralytic, any pressors that might need to be given or started prior to the intubation attempt, and then my ongoing analgesia and sedation as well. All right, going back to our big mnemonic here, positioning. First of all, you need to get a patient in a sniffing position. This is the sniffing position, right? Not that. Not that's the sniffing position. That's where you need to get them. And then head of bed at 30 degrees specifically for this patient. Anybody with a big belly, whether they're obese or pregnant, that's going to push on the diaphragm. Setting the head at 30 degrees, gravity is going to pull that belly down. So on those patients, you nef definitely need to do it. But I would argue you need to channel your inner Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Heads up intubation, head of bed 30 degrees intubation is pretty similar to a flat intubation, but it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different and you need to be proficient in that if you're going to do it at all. So I would advocate just do it every time so that you make sure you're proficient with it. We have our patient positioned. We got to set up our monitor. The patient's at risk for post-intubation hypotension every time. So we want to know about it. Set your blood pressure to cycle every minute or push that stat button so it cycles over and over. Or if an airway may be in this patient's future and you've got a few minutes, get an A-line in. So you have second to second feedback on your blood pressure. And then your pulse oximeter, you want that on, obviously. But if you can, turn your tones on so that you get that auditory feedback, that dee, 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 if they start to desaturate. A lot of you are thinking, my monitors don't do that. I've been told that at every shop I go to and I play around with the monitor and I figure out how to turn it on. Usually you select the pulse oximeter and then there's an option that says either rate volume or QRS volume and you turn that up and you get that auditory feedback so you know immediately if your patient's desaturating. You're responsible for setting up your monitor and then finally your emergency, not finally, but your emergency backup stuff. So the first thing here, this is what usually people recite to me, video laryngoscopy, bougie, supraglottic airway, and then the end of my algorithm is always a scalpel to do a crike. So first of all, video laryngoscopy, the evidence is clean cut here. This needs to be first line every time. 
higher rates of first pass success, lower rates of hypoxia. This is a phenomenal meta-analysis. If you doubt video laryngoscopy, search for this PubMed ID, read this meta-analysis. I don't think there's any excuse now not to use video laryngoscopy first time with every intubation. If you're concerned about your DL, your direct laryngoscopy skills deteriorating, get the standard geometry blades. Look with DL, and if you have any issues, you've got the screen right up there. But DL really needs to be over here on something you use every time. And then there's the question of the bougie. Bruce Lee wants to practice one kick 10,000 times. So channeling my inner Bruce Lee, I pull the bougie over here, something that I use every time. You need to at least use it enough to be proficient. If you're going to vocalize this as part of your emergency backup plan, you need to use it enough to be proficient. I don't know what that number is, but it's at least 10 times a year at a minimum, which is interesting because that's also the average number of intubations that an ER doctor does in one year. So if you're only doing 10 intubations a year, yeah, you need to use the bougie every time to make sure you're proficient with it. If you're doing 10 a week, if you're doing 10 a month, Maybe not every time, but you need to make sure you're using it enough to remain proficient with it. And then finally, entitled CO2. That's not the little color metric, yellow, purple thing. It's waveform entitled CO2. Dr. Hoxstein has a phenomenal presentation coming up on waveform entitled CO2, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it here. But this is my checklist. This is what I'm doing every time before I push meds. Okay.